The Round Table Number 1. On the Love of Life January 15, 1815 By William Hazlitt It is our intention, in the course of these papers, occasionally to expose certain vulgar errors, which have crept into our reasonings on men and manners. Perhaps one of the most interesting of these, is that which relates to the source of our general attachment to life. We are not going to enter into the question, whether life is, on the whole, to be regarded as a blessing, though we are by no means inclined to adopt the opinion of that sage, who thought that the best thing that could have happened to a man was never to have been born, and the next best to have died the moment after he came into existence. The common argument, however, which is made use of to prove the value of life, from the strong desire which almost every one feels for its continuance, appears to be altogether inconclusive. The wise and the foolish, the weak and the strong, the lame and the blind, the prisoner and the free, the prosperous and the wretched, the beggar and the king, the rich and the poor, the young and the old, from the little child who tries to leap over his own shadow, to the old man who stumbles blindfold on his grave, all feel this desire in common. Our notions with respect to the importance of life, and our attachment to it, depend on a principle, which has very little to do with its happiness or its misery. The love of life is, in general, the effect not of our enjoyments, but of our passions. We are not attached to it so much for its own sake, or as it is connected with happiness, as because it is necessary to action. Without life there can be no action, no objects of pursuit no restless desires, no tormenting passions. Hence it is that we fondly cling to it, that we dread its termination as the close, not of enjoyment, but of hope. The proof that our attachment to life is not absolutely owing to the immediate satisfaction we find in it, is, that those persons are commonly found most loath to part with it who have the least enjoyment of it, and who have the greatest difficulties to struggle with, as losing gamesters are the most desperate. And farther, there are not many persons who, with all their pretended love to of life, would not, if it had been in their power, have melted down the longest life to a few hours. The schoolboy, says Addison, counts the time till the return of the holidays, the minor longs to be of age, the lover is impatient till he is married. Hope and fantastic expectations spend much of our lives, and while with passion we look for a coronation, or the death of an enemy, or a day of joy, passing from fancy to possession without any intermediate notices, we throw away a precious year, Jeremy Taylor. We would willingly, and without remorse, sacrifice not only the present moment, but all the interval, no matter how long, that separates us from any favorite object. We chiefly look upon life, then, as the means to an end. Its common enjoyments and its daily evils are alike disregarded for any idle purpose we have in view. It should seem as if there were a few green sunny spots in the desert of life, to which we are always hastening forward, we eye them wistfully in the distance, and care not what perils or suffering we endure, so that we arrive at them at last. However weary we may be of the same stale round, however sick of the past, however hopeless of the future. The mind still revolts at the thought of death, because the fancied possibility of good, which always remains with life, gathers strength as it is about to be torn from us forever, and the dullest scene looks bright compared with the darkness of the grave. Our reluctance to part with existence evidently does not depend on the common even current of our lives, but on the force and impulse of the passions. Hence that indifference to death which has been sometimes remarked in people who lead a solitary and peaceful life in remote and barren districts. The pulse of life in them does not beat strong enough to occasion any violent revulsion of the frame when it ceases. He who treads the green mountain turf, or he who sleeps beneath it, enjoys an almost equal quiet. The death of those persons has always been accounted happy, who had attained their utmost wishes who had nothing left to regret or to desire. Our repugnance to death increases in proportion to our consciousness of having lived in vain, to the violence of our efforts, and the keenness of our disappointments, and to our earnest desire to find in the future, if possible, a rich amends for the past. We may be said to nurse our existence with the greatest tenderness, 
according to the pain it has cost us, and feel at every step of our varying progress the truth of that line of the poet. An ounce of sweet is worth a pound of sour. The love of life is in fact the sum of all our passions and of all our enjoyments, but these are by no means the same thing, for the three vehemence of our passions is irritated, not less by disappointment than by the prospect of success. Nothing seems to be a match for this general tenaciousness of existence, but such an extremity either of bodily or mental suffering as destroys at once the power both of habit and imagination. In short, the question, whether life is accompanied with a greater quantity of pleasure or pain, may be fairly set aside as frivolous, and of no practical utility, for our attachment to life depends on our interest in it and it cannot be denied that we have more interest in this moving, busy scene, agitated with a thousand hopes and fears, and checkered with every diversity of joy and sorrow, than in a dreary blank. To be something is better than to be nothing, because we can feel no interest in nothing. Passion, imagination, self-will, the sense of power, the very consciousness of our existence, bind us to life and hold us fast in its chains, as by a magic spell, in spite of every other consideration. Nothing can be more philosophical than the reasoning which Milton puts into the mouth of the fallen angel. And that must end us, that must be our cure. To be no more, sad cure, for who would lose? Though full of pain, this intellectual being. Those thoughts that wander through eternity. To perish rather, swallowed up and lost in the wide womb of uncreated night. Devoid of sense and motion? Nearly the same account may be given in answer to the question which has been asked, why so few tyrants kill themselves? In the first place, they are never satisfied with the mischief they have done, and cannot quit their hold of power, after all sense of pleasure is fled. Besides, they absurdly argue from the means of happiness placed within their reach to the end itself and, dazzled by the pomp and pageantry of a throne, cannot relinquish the persuasion that they ought to be happier than other men. The prejudice of opinion, which attaches us to life, is in them stronger than in others, and incorrigible to experience. The great are life's fools, dupes of the splendid shadows that surround them, and wedded to the very mockeries of opinion. Whatever is our situation or pursuit in life, the result will be much the same. The strength of the passion seldom corresponds to the pleasure we find in its indulgence. The miser robs himself to increase his store, the ambitious man toils up a slippery precipice only to be tumbled headlong from its height, the lover is infatuated with the charms of his mistress, exactly in proportion to the mortifications for he has received from her. Even those who succeed in nothing, who, as it has been emphatically expressed, are made desperate by too quick a sense of constant infelicity, cut off from peace like exiles, on some barren rock. Their life's sad prison, with no more of ease than sentinels between two armies set, are yet as unwilling as others to give over the unprofitable strife, their harassed feverish existence refuses rest, and frets the languor of exhausted hope into the torture of unavailing regret. The exile, who has been unexpectedly restored to his country and to liberty, often finds his courage fail with the accomplishment of all his wishes, and the struggle of life and hope ceases at the same instant. We once more repeat, that we do not, in the foregoing remarks, mean to enter into a comparative estimate of the value of human life, but merely to show that the strength of our attachment to it is a very fallacious test of its happiness, 